title of uh, my presentation is, What Are They Waiting For? And there are two facts about waiting. First, everybody hates waiting. Second, everybody's waiting for something. The scriptures are full of stories of people waiting, and I'm going to mention four people quickly and then take up the theme of waiting as a diagnostic tool in apologetics. Embedded in the great Christmas story of Luke chapter two are two relatively obscure folks who emerge from the shadows and then recede into obscurity. Each is characterized by his and her waiting. When Joseph and Mary take Jesus to the temple for purification, they meet these two characters. First, Simeon. He's described as a righteous and devout man who is waiting for the consolation of Israel. When he takes the baby into his arms, he prays, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. Anna is described as a prophet who stayed in the temple fasting and praying. And when she saw Jesus, she, Luke says, gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. She was one of a special group, those who were waiting for the promised redemption. They knew God would redeem, and now she saw the redemption begin to unfold. In John chapter five, we're told of a man who is lying by the pool at Bethsaida. He had been an invalid 38 years. He had no one to lower him into the pool when the angel of the Lord stirred the waters. Jesus asked, do you want to get well? He had been waiting for healing. Waiting can turn to hopelessness. In Mark 10, Jesus is leaving Jericho. There's a blind man named Bartimaeus sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. As a beggar, Bartimaeus was waiting for a few coins. As a human being, he was waiting for mercy. All four were waiting. All four encountered Jesus as the fulfillment of their deepest desires. These themes raise for me an important question. What are people today waiting for? How is Jesus the fulfillment of what they are waiting for? How is he good news for them? Now our first answer will be revealing. We might think what people are waiting for today is forgiveness. That might be our answer because this is the way we explain the gospel. The gospel is good news, we say, because our neighbors can experience the forgiveness that Jesus brings. Now, it is true that Jesus makes forgiveness possible, and this is good news. In fact, this is the kernel of the good news. At least we know it's good news, but do our neighbors think this way? Do they think of this as good news? Does it sound like good news to them? Is this what they're waiting for? When I lived in Connecticut, I, uh, before I moved here, I was driving up Interstate 95, or uh, to translate, the 95, and uh, I saw a billboard that said, shouldn't your bank do more? I started to think about it. I don't care what my bank does. <laughs> as long as I get a lollipop when I go to the bank. And I began to think what motivates a bank to hire an advertising firm and rent out a billboard and put a slogan like that on the billboard. And I thought, this bank 
spent a lot of money to try to get people to switch banks. And they're appealing to a set of needs and concerns that I can't even understand. And sometimes I think we hold forth the gospel in the same way. We're holding forth the gospel as an answer to a question that nobody is asking. Shouldn't your billboard, or shouldn't your bank do more? When we think of the gospel only in terms of forgiveness, we might be like that bank. Now, it is a fact that everybody needs forgiveness from God. But that fact is not one people recognize. In fact, if anyone needs forgiveness, most people today think it's God that needs forgiveness. What are people waiting for? I think people are waiting to be human. People are fighting a terrible battle to be human. People want to be human. We want a meaningful experience of our own humanity. Now, nobody says out loud, I want to be human. Instead, we say things like, I want to feel alive. I want a job I'm passionate about. I want to make a difference. We dream about our future accomplishments. We make bucket lists. We are striving after something, something human. We all want to be human. And in this sense, our friends who do not know Jesus yet and ourselves, we are all in the same boat. Before I, I moved to California and came to Biola, I worked for 20 years at the Rivendell Institute at Yale. And for almost half that time, I was a part-time teacher in the philosophy department there. And I thought long and hard about uh, what shaped my students as they walked into my classes. Most of them were first-year students most of the time that I taught. And one day it occurred to me to ask the question to myself, what do I want my students to lie awake at night and worry about? <laughs> right? I was sure they were going to lie awake at night and worry about something, but what if I got to chose what they worried about? So I would begin the year once we got oriented, and I would write on the board the question, what kind of person should I be? And then I would talk about how this is the most important philosophical question. It touches every area of philosophy. It touches metaphysics. What does it mean to be human? It touches epistemology. How can we know? It touches moral philosophy. Philosophy of religion. Is there a God and how does God matter to this question? Political philosophy. How do we order ourselves together in society? It became the theme of our class as we read through Plato and Aristotle and Sexus Empiricus and Augustine and Aquinas. What kind of person should I be? I knew that if a student wrestled with this question, she would be a better reader of philosophy, she would be a better human being, and she would be closer to the gospel. How is our shared longing to be human a gospel longing? The Christian drama is centered on the celebration that God himself became human. Jesus was fully God and fully human. Now, especially in apologetics, in, in, an, in an apologetics context, we see that we quickly skip the fully human part and concentrate on the full divinity of Jesus. The church in the past 250 years emphasized the fact that Jesus was fully divine, and we paid much less attention to the fact that he was fully human. Now, there are very good reasons the church has done this. This is a good thing, not a bad thing. The history of critical biblical scholarship since the late 17th century can be described as a strategy to take the divine out of Jesus. So the miracles are eliminated. The resurrection is considered a myth. Jesus' unique claims to equality with God are thought to be a later addition to the text. Jesus is a human and nothing more. 
Now, most of our engagement with secular thinking on this point has been to defend the true divinity of Jesus. We have needed to do this, and we will always need to do this. We will always need to defend that Jesus in history was fully God incarnate. Another theme is the direction of clinical psychology since Freud in the early 20th century has been grounded on the assumption of the fundamental adequacy of human beings to solve our own problems, as long as you have a good therapist. There's a fundamental denial of the historic fall that we have rebelled against God and that this rebellion is what distorts our humanity. And because it's a rebellion against God, we need divine intervention. So the church has had to emphasize the reality of sin and brokenness against the shallow humanism of secular culture. That shallow humanism is captured in the title of a best-selling book from 1967, I'm Okay, You're Okay. Now, as a result, the church has had to emphasize human sinfulness. We've needed to do this, and we will always need to do this. But the unfortunate side effect is we lose sight of the humanness of Jesus and the importance of the humanness of Jesus. If we lose track of the humanity of Jesus, we cannot know what it means to be human. We cannot know what kind of people we should be or what kind of people we want to be. The humanity of Jesus is one way our friends can begin to see the gospel as good news for them right now. Jesus is the picture of what it means to be human. He is our model. We follow him. The good news is that our becoming fully human is not something we have to figure out on our own. He is our model. He provides the pattern for our lives. But the good news goes farther. He is not simply a model. And this is where the role of the Holy Spirit is so important. Jesus promised the Holy Spirit that the Spirit would dwell within us and lead us and guide us and change us. The life in the spirit is the truly human life. When we ask what kind of people we should be, what kind of people do we want to be? We should think about Paul's words in Galatians. But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Give that list to any person who's far from Jesus, and they will recognize that is the truly good human life. This is what the Spirit produces in us. The life we live apprenticed to Jesus and the power of the Spirit offers a fully sane and truly human life. It's a fundamental theological point that sometimes we miss. The gospel is not a story of escape from our humanity. It is a story of growing into our full humanity. We will never be more fully human than when we see him face to face, than when he produces the new heavens and the new earth and calls us to live with him forever. We will be most fully human. I'm trying to bridge a couple of concepts here. I'm trying to build a bridge between our sense of what it means to be human and what discipleship is. Because I think we often have a fragmented picture. And the fragmentation tends us to think what it means to be human is a very different thing than what it means to be a faithful follower of Jesus. And we turn being a faithful follower of Jesus into some kind of um, extracurricular moralistic hobby. Rather than kayaking, I will follow Jesus because I don't like exercise. (laughs) But the life of discipleship is the truly human life. We are called to grow into the humanity that God created us to experience. 
When he redeems all things, he redeems our full humanity. One of my colleagues at, in Connecticut at the Rivendell Institute said, if God became truly human in Jesus, then everything that's really human is part of his redemptive concern. So we have to bask in the full humanity of Jesus. What does this mean? What does this mean for us? This is where our gospel message can be received as good news because people are fighting a terrible battle to be human. Everybody is longing for a life that is whole and sane and relationships that are characterized by love, by peace, by joy, and a relationship to our work that's characterized by contentment and the fruition of a purpose that stands outside of ourselves. People are scrambling for this. At the end of the great two verses in Romans that we often talk about, Romans 12, 1 and 2, Paul says, verse 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then he goes on and says, so that you can show that or prove that the will of God is good, acceptable, and perfect. I love that. That the will of God is good and acceptable and perfect. I call a gap good, acceptable, and perfect. And I say, everybody has a gap theory. The gap theory is, what is it that makes for a good, acceptable, and perfect life? And as we are transformed by the renewing of our mind, having already laid our life on the altar, verse 1, our life demonstrates that the apprenticeship to the life of Jesus is a good, acceptable, perfect human life. It is fitting to what it means to be human. This is the high call. This is a fulcrum in our challenge to hold forth the gospel as a compelling vision of life in this time. It's a fulcrum. There's leverage. There's power here because God has created us to be human and then he's given us the spirit to transform us and rehabilitate our broken humanity, which we truly experience in this life, the rehabilitation, and we will experience fully when he completes the process. For too long, we've gotten our vision of the afterlife from Looney Tunes cartoons. And we think of people floating around on clouds with harps. And so we, we have absorbed a vision that the life to which God is directing us is somehow subhuman. It's a life of, of a, a mere shadow of who we are and who we long to be. But the Christian story tells a different story. We were created to be human. That humanity is twisted by our own rebellion. And God launched the process of the redemption of all things of the human. There are three great Christmas songs. I know it's not quite Christmas, and, I, and I'm contributing to a cultural sin here by starting to talk about Christmas before Thanksgiving. I mean, it's not actually even Halloween, and, uh, and it's still 80 degrees out. But there are three great Christmas songs that warrant meditation. First, a line from O Holy Night. Long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. When he appeared, the human soul felt its worth because he became fully human. He took on our humanity. 
Joy to the world. No more let sin and sorrow reign, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings known as far as the curse is found. And then he repeats it, as far as the curse is found. As far as the curse is found. He comes to make his blessings known so far. In fact, there is nothing that sin distorts that is outside the scope of God's redemption. Sometimes we have a narrow picture of redemption, that God is the invasion of the body snatchers, snatching souls, whatever they are, out of this world. But no, God is in the transformation process. As far as that distortion happens, that's how far his blessings will be found. Everything that's bent will be straightened. Everything that's distorted will be clarified. Whatever, whatever sin twists, he will heal. And then, O oh, little town of Bethlehem, there's a, a line that says, the hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. What are the hopes and fears of our friends who do not yet know Jesus? How is the gospel good news for them in their hopes and fears? Now, everybody has surface hopes and fears, things at the surface, but we all have deep hopes and fears. The hopes and fears of every person involves being known, being valued. Not a love born out of condescension and pity, but a love of true delight and true value. In other words, the hopes and fears of people are centered on being human, experiencing and living a full rich, sane human life. The life that God calls us to in his spirit, that we would manifest the fruit of the spirit. We would live lives that exemplify the love, the joy, and the peace, because this is God's work in us restoring our humanity. So three things to think about. First, celebrate your humanity. God made you human on purpose. He really likes the fact that you're human. Don't pretend it's a bad thing because it's a good thing. Rejoice in the tasks of being human. Work, play, food, family, friends, study, beauty, Music. Rejoice in these things. Celebrate your humanity. I believe what the church can do in our culture today is have a renaissance of Christian humanism, where everything human is celebrated in the church because it's part of the gracious gift of God. Secondly, affirm humanness wherever you see it. Remember, everybody you meet is fighting a battle to be human. Affirm them, love them, listen, point them to the bringer of life. Think, I am going to, by the power of God, treat every person as a human being. Make eye contact, say a word, and think all I can do is affirm their humanity and see what God opens. Uh, the church I go to, uh, the Vine Church in Fullerton, we're part of a um, homeless ministry that is centered in our church, but there are five or six churches where volunteers come. And we provide, twice a month, we provide, um, uh, we have a, a trailer that has showers in it. And we, we 
take laundry from the, our homeless guests. And so we have one team that takes the laundry to the laundromat and another team that runs showers. And we provide towels and everything. And, and so our friends can have showers and then there's a meal. But the whole goal is not to fix problems of homelessness, it's to affirm humanity. And to say, look, you are valued. To look people in the eye and to restore dignity. Anytime you restore or affirm the dignity of another person, you are seeing the work of the Spirit overflow in your life. You are treating them with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. Third, first, celebrate your, hum, hum, your humanity. Second, affirm humanness wherever you see it. Third, tell the story of the gospel in part as a story of God's investment in your being human. It's God's plan to restore your humanity. What kind of person should you be? What kind of person do you want to be? We want to be people who reflect the character of the Spirit, the character the Spirit wants to produce in us. And we can tell the gospel this way. One of the things that God has accomplished for us in Christ, in the atonement, in, in, the, in the resurrection, is the restoration of our humanity. We are forgiven and we are born into a new redeemed experience. Long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. Discover who you're called to be at Biola University, a leading Christ-centered university in Los Angeles with programs on campus and online. Subscribe for more of our videos and learn more at biola.edu.